the cup of the Lord versus the cup of devils. This will be the fifth part of the series of the King Jesus Version videos, trying to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and His perfect Word and um, give you faith that you can trust this book, this authorized version, King James Bible, also nickname it the King Jesus Version. Um, you can have faith that this is God's perfect book. And uh, if you don't believe in that, well, I don't think it took for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because ultimately, if you reject the perfect authority of the King James Bible, you will rely on your own authority. You create your own Bible based on your own preferences. You can prefer whichever Greek text you want. And I like this translation over that translation. But I reject the one way that they translate this. And they should have said this better and whatever else. It's a problem. You have a philosophical problem. That's the whole issue with these new versionists. But let's look here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 through 22. The Bible says, I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Watch the last study if you want to see more about communion. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, look at this, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Oh, it's a Holy Mary, Immaculate Mother of Mary, Immaculately Conceived, Assumed up into Heaven, and she's a devil. Queen of Heaven. They worshipped her in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, you know. Um, she's a devil. Uh, she's a Starte, Ashtaroth, and all these other, Diana, and Shingmu, and all these other names that they had for this Goddess of Heaven. She's a devil. Well, what about Allah, another devil? Uh, the moon god Allah, you know. Don't moon me, Allah. Uh, he's a devil. What about Buddha? Devil. What about uh, Saint so-and-so? Padre Pio and, and this saint here and this saint there and Saint Teresa and Saint the... Devils. People that, were manif that had devils in them. Okay? <laughs> you don't sacrifice to them. But look at verse 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. There's a distinction there. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You cannot have fellowship there with lost people and saved people. They're contrary. Again, the thing of communion. We're supposed to have communion with God. If you want communion with God, there's only one God that you can commune with. You can't say, well, I'm going to commune with God and a few other, other, you know, a few other false gods or something. And that doesn't work. You have to have communion with God alone. We're to be of one mind among ourselves as the body of Christ to, in order to have communion with each other as well. But I want you to notice a very unique two-word little phrase here. Verse 21, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. It's not a suggestion. You can if you want to. You don't have to. We can agree to disagree, whatever. It's ye cannot. That is a plain command of Scripture. Uh, I did a study many years ago about the... Um, commandments in the New Testament, New Testament commandments. I forget what it was called. People were saying, do we have to keep the Ten Commandments in the New Testament? That was the point of the study, but then to say, actually, you know, there's a lot more than just Ten Commandments. Okay, I realize the Ten Commandments given to Moses and everything else, um, but there's a lot of commandments in the New Testament when you get right down to it. And here's one of them. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't do both. Let's look at some interesting things here. The book of Joshua, chapter 24. When is the very first time that the words ye cannot? When is it first mentioned? Joshua, chapter 24 is where it's first mentioned. 
Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 19. Joshua 24, verse 19, says, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot, command there, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for He is an holy God, He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, like devils that we read about in the New Testament, then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that He hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord, your, unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will, will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, written, if you get that, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. Um, the Lord spoke words to us, and he says, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't serve other gods, you see. If you're going to serve Jesus Christ, he's saying, There's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, I think it is, about Jesus there, you know. Jesus is the only one that you can serve. The Lord's not up there saying, hey, I'm okay. I, you know, there's a bunch of other gods that I kind of accept, worship it. Ultimately, it gets back to me anyhow. No, no. The name of Jesus and Jesus alone. Matthew chapter 6. I'll show you another ye cannot. Another interesting one. Maybe some of you have already thought of this one. A New Testament one. Ye cannot. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 24, the Bible says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Hmm. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. What's mammon? It's basically a name for an, when you make money, your idol. Money becomes your god. You can, you're no longer serving God when money is your God. I have to think about that one. 1 Timothy chapter 6. How much uh, time do you put into trying to uh, get rich? How much time do you put into trying to serve the Lord? Saying, are, we shouldn't, are you saying we shouldn't work, Brother Brian? No, no I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if uh, all of your desires in life circle around money <laughs> that's a problem first timothy chapter 6 verses 10 through 11 for the love of money is the root of all evil either you will love the one and hate the other remember which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows but thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You can get messed up. I mean, that passage right there is talking to a Christian. You know, they have erred from the faith. Lost people aren't in the faith. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Well, um, if you get to messing around and you get away from the Lord and get away from His Word, uh, you will pierce yourself through with many sorrows. Um, if you watch the last study, um, you're not in communion with the Lord. You don't judge yourself. You don't judge your sins through the reading of God's Word. Uh, for this cause, many are weak and sickly, and many sleep. Many, many are sick and weakly among you, and many sleep. You pierce yourself through with many sorrows. In other words, you can really get messed up if you get away from the Word of God. In other words... Okay, John chapter 8. 
Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 43 and 44. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Um, why can't certain people understand God's word? Uh, well, because they're of their father the devil. They're drinking the cup of devils? Hmm. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Interesting. Galatians chapter 5. If you're saved and you're born again, you say, well, I, I could never be, you know, worshiping the devil and whatever else. Well, I understand the thing that you're bought with a price and whatever else. I understand that. But you can get really out of fellowship with the Lord. I've seen it. You can get people that are really messed up. It's very dangerous to get into that. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, now let me ask you a question. How would a Christian fall for those different things? if there's no influence of devils to mess up your flesh. Hmm. And how do you fall for those things if you're staying in the Word of God on a daily basis? Most people don't. Well, what's the problem? You get away from communion with the Spirit and you start to have fellowship with devils. Like our text says here, I'm not saying this is fellowship with the devils. You get away from reading the Word of God, in other words, and pretty soon you start to get messed up and the works of the flesh start to become the major driving force in your life. And instead of remembering, ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, you start to say, well, okay, and you start to let your standards slip. And I'm not talking about areas where you have liberty or whatever else, where God doesn't really, it's not a huge deal, or whatever. There are areas of liberty. Um, I'm talking about, um, you know, really getting messed up in things that the Bible openly condemns, which we read about in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21 there. But uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, let's think about that again there. If you remember what it said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21, Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Ye cannot. What does it say in verse 17? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Ye cannot. Hmm. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, what are we talking about here? The cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Well, what would be another good thing to do? See, again, if I rely on my own wisdom, I would try to come up with, you know, amazing verses that just, you know, wow, he's such a scholar and whatever else and things. And another interpretation of this, another way to translate this would be, you know, then people would start to worship me. Um, that's never what I've tried to do in this ministry. What I want people to do is I want them to rely on this book right here. So when you come up with a study of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, you say, how could I gain deeper understanding from the scriptures? I know, maybe I should do a word study. And that's why I've always done word studies. And I've had lost people 
they get all mad at me and you know whatever else he just does these word studies he just milks that system no it's not milking the system it's what you do when you're a bible believer and you try to give god's word the credit right uh it to the lost world they say well that's just a dumb way to do it you should be reading theological books and all this other stuff yeah because you see those devils they just want to slow me down they want me to read a whole bunch of books and all the commentaries and you know in 19 or in 1892 this commentary said this and and uh, now that is a good way that he said it but actually if you go back into the eight, early 1800s and this theologian said this and that theologian said that and and if we read a church father so and so you know no what does the bible say what's the best commentary on the bible the bible itself the holy spirit will be the one that teaches you the words of god uh, the writings of men are okay, but they're not scripture. So when you get people with their mighty expositions and quoting this guy and quoting that guy, um, there's some problems there. Uh, I want to see what the Bible says. So I look and I say, cup of Lord, cup of the devil, or, the cup of the Lord, the cup of devils. Um, maybe I should look up the word cup. What was the first time that the word cup showed up in the Bible? And see if there's something interesting there. So... Let's go to Genesis chapter 40. We'll see about the first time that this word cup shows up. Any significance, see if there's any significance to our study today. And there is. Genesis chapter 40. See, the, the lost world, they want to cripple people. And they get scared when somebody has this sword of the Spirit here. And they're wielding it. They don't like that. They want you to have to be slowed down with all kinds of other things and permissions and licenses and agreements and official ordinations and church buildings and, you know, you're, it's not legal for you to say that and whatever else. I prefer to give people the power in their hands. Genesis chapter 40, verse 6 through 13. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me then, tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine was three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth grape, ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup, first time it appears, was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Um, and Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. So, pretty interesting there but uh, the question comes up uh, I wonder how many devils were in Pharaoh's cup uh, understanding what Pharaoh was a part of the fa fact that he was ruling Egypt um, probably quite a few devils in that cup uh, I'm sure he was a pretty uh, had some pretty evil things about him I'm sure but now let's go to Genesis chapter 44 Verses 1 and 2. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest and his corn money. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. If you know the story of Joseph there, he gets out of prison eventually. And Pharaoh's cup is gold, but... Uh, Joseph is now basically second in command, so he gets a silver cup. Hmm, some interesting things there. But uh, he basically gets his own cup. Hmm. And what does it lead to? It leads to sin. Let me show you. Go down to verse 4 in the same passage there, chapter 44, verse 4. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men. And when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? 
ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. Okay? Joseph said unto his stewards. So it was Joseph saying this. So the, Joseph says, basically, he lies and puts this cup in there, puts it in his younger brother's sack, and then he says, go after him and tell him, hey, that's my cup that I divine in. <laughs> I can see things. Sort of a scrying device is what it would be called in the occult. A crystal ball or a little thing of water or whatever else. And he says, I can divine in there. Um, I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, what was the problem there? Well, I believe the cup of devils was starting to influence Joseph. Hmm. He got that cup when he was in Egypt to show his authority and his power. And it actually led to him starting to lie and deceive and say that he had occult powers when he didn't. Go to Psalm 11. Interesting uh, first mention there, first little bit of the story that first he, it's a reference to Pharaoh's golden cup and then it's a reference, the next one there is a reference to Joseph's silver cup and that silver cup causes Joseph to sin and to lie. Hmm. Psalm 11 verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, his countenance doth behold the upright. Hmm. So basically when the wicked partake of the cup of devils, God pours out his judgment and his wrath upon them. Hmm. Do you want to be a partaker of the cup of devils? I don't. The Bible talks in the New Testament about being partakers with them if you mess around with the sins of the wicked lost world. Um, pretty dangerous. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 19. Jeremiah 2, 19. Okay, and we read here. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. You know, the worst thing the Lord can do to somebody is let them... Give them over to their own evil devices, their own evil things that they're doing. The, their wickedness actually corrects them. They start to go after the cup of devils. They're drinking from that cup and they get the wrath of God as a result of it. You see, there's a lot of sin that is actually self-punishing. You get messing around in that sin, it'll actually you pu you're punishing yourself. You go out and you start drinking heavily some night, you are guaranteeing yourself a hangover. You go and you start to smoke cigarettes and things like crazy, you are guaranteeing yourself emphysema or lung cancer or other bad things. You go and you, you fornicate or you get into sodomy or whatever else, you're guaranteeing yourself some kind of a sexually transmitted disease. You see what I'm saying? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. You start to get around to messing around with the cup of devils and you will get corruption. You actually get God's judgment as a result of that. That's why the Bible warns a Christian um, you cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You cannot drink the cup of devils and the cup of the Lord. Very important to remember that. <clears throat> Psalm 16. Let's go back there. Psalm 16. Psalm 16, verses 1 through 5. I'll show you some very important things in this passage. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness exalteth, extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. 
Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another god. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Huh. Thou maintainest my lot. All right. Hmm. Let's think about a couple points here. Point number one, preserve me. It says there, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Interesting. Preserve me. Kind of like God does with the Bible. He preserves the Bible. Um, and in thee, in the word of God, in other words, do I put my trust. Interesting. Point number two, sorrow comes from hastening after another God. Drink, in verse four there, um, drink offerings from a cup of blood are tied to the false gods slash devils. Exactly. You're drinking of the cup of devils. That's a false god. There are devils, and it's going to mess you up. And sorrow comes from that. Verse 5, the Lord is the portion of my cup. Cup of the Lord versus the cup of devils. Again, you see that there. Verse 5, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Cup of the Lord. Pretty interesting. Now look at verse 6. Psalm 16, verse 6. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Almost like the lines of the Bible. Hmm. Verse 7. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in, in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Huh. The Lord hath given me counsel, the passage says there. How about I have set the Lord... The Word of God, in other words, always before me. I mean, how can you set the Lord always before you? Uh, well, I understand that this is not God here, per se, but it's about God. You set it always before you. It'll lead to blessing. I shall not be moved. There's another thing we just read there. I'm not going to be moved on my beliefs with this King James Bible here. My heart is glad. Well, how do you get a heart that's glad by hiding God's word in your heart. The cup of the New Testament, remember? The cup of the Lord. Verse or, uh, number six here, thing I've written down. Show me the path of life. God's word is a light unto your path, and the words are spirit and life, like we talked about in the other studies. Hmm. The seventh point I want to make here is in thy presence. When you read God's word, Okay, and uh, what does it say there? Let's read verse 11 again. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Hmm. An interesting thing there. Um, what was the verse again that said that, Brother Brian? Um, that would be Psalm 16, 11. I'll say that one more time. That uh, verse we just read there was Psalm 16, 11. Well, oh, that's just a coincidence. Now, come on here. <laughs> Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Hmm. Very true of this blessed uh, book that was originally written in 1611. Nothing to it, I'm sure. Psalm 75. Psalm 75. Uh, Psalm 75, verses 6 and 8. 
says here, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Comes from the north. <laughs> but God is the judge. He putteth down one, and setteth up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same, but the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out, and drink them. Um, hmm. The Lord is there, and he has a cup in his hand that's filled with red wine, kind of like the cup of the New Testament, the blood, blood being very symbolic of, you know, red wine, essentially. That's what Jesus had at the Last Supper, gave them red wine, symbolizing blood. Hmm, the blood of the New Testament, the cup of the blood of the New Testament, or the cup of the New Testament in my blood, to get the exact wording there. Very interesting. Psalm 116. Go to Psalm 116. Psalm 116, verse, verses 10 through 13. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, says in the book of Romans. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Huh. The cup of salvation connected to calling upon the name of the Lord. Um, salvation is always connected to calling upon the Lord, by the way. Um, that's just common sense to anybody that's saved. If you want help, you call. You know, I fall down and I'm hurt. I don't just lay there and I'm believing somebody will come to help me. You start to yell, help, help. You want to be saved, you call upon the Lord. Not that difficult. Anybody that doesn't get that is lost. I can tell you that. It's just plain English. Well, call upon the Lord. I don't really know what it means. I think we should just kind of re-examine it. Yeah. Isaiah 51. Isaiah chapter 51. Go there to that passage. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17 through 23. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You know the New Testament? Let me just stop here for a minute. The New Testament is a great blessing or a great cursing, depending on which side you're on. Hmm. Continuing, verse 17. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. There is none to guide her among all the sons of whom she hath brought forth. Neither is there any that taketh her by the hand of all the sons that she hath brought up. These two things are come unto thee. Who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation and destruction and the famine and the sword. Get back to that as we continue. By whom shall I comfort thee? Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of thy God. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith the Lord, the Lord, thy Lord, the Lord, excuse me, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people, because I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury, thou shalt no more drink it again. But I will put it into the hand of them that afflict thee, which have said to thy soul, Bow down, that we may go over, and thou hast laid thy body as, as the ground and as the street to them that are, went over. Huh. So you have the Jews there, and God is saying, here, oh, you want the cup? Okay, here you go. Drink it. It's my fury, because you're not following my word. You're not listening to me. You're not keeping my commandments. But the time comes when he says, okay, that's enough. Now I'm actually going to give it to those that afflict you. Hmm. You say, what's that? A almost seems prophetic. Yeah, I believe it is. I believe it's a prophecy for the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah chapter 25. Go to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 15. 
Jeremiah 25, verse 15 says, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I shall, to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink, and be moved, and be mad, because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the, dra all the nations to drink, unto whom the Lord had sent me. Interesting, because he told his disciples at the Last Supper, he says, Drink ye all of it. That's a blessing to them. But... When he tells lost people, drink this cup, the cup of his wrath, it's kind of like the cup of devils that he pours out upon them and says, okay, you want to serve devils? You want to serve other gods? Okay, drink it. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. You see how that works? The sinner will be filled with his ways. Hmm. Verse 18. Uh, seeing okay. To which Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a des desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day, Pharaoh king of Egypt and his servants and his princes and all his people, and all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkelon and Aza and Ekron and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon and all the kings of Tyrus, and all the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the isles which are beyond the sea, Dedan and Tima and Buz, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and all the kings of Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak, shall drink after them. Therefore thus, therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more, because of the sword which I will send among you. Interesting, we'll stop there for just a minute, that the cup of the Lord is a blessing. The cup of devils, he says, Okay, you want to live on all that sin? Okay, there you go. And it's connected with a sword. Remember that. Verse 28. And it shall be that if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then, thou, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name, and, shall, and should ye be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they, they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised from up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Howl ye shepherds, and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and of your dis dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel." And the shepherds shall have no way to flee, nor the principal of the flock to escape. A voice of the cry of the shepherds and an howling of the principal of the flock shall be heard, for the Lord hath spoiled their pasture. And the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his covert he, as the lion, for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. So, the Lord... It gets to a point where the Lord simply says, okay, I've had enough. He will hide himself so that he cannot be found. He will not listen when people call upon him. Um, but the time comes when his judgment hits and when his cup gets poured out. Oh, you want the cup of devils, do you? Then drink it. Oh, oh, oh wait, I didn't know I had to drink that. No, I don't want it.
drink it. I'm going to bring a sword upon the earth. And if you read it with a believing heart, if you're born again, it's a blessing. This edge of the sword, say it this way. This edge of the sword here is razor sharp. And this will trim off all the bad things from your life as a Christian. But this edge of the sword here is the one that he brings down on the wicked. Which one is it going to be? Do you want uh, this side with the blessing or this side with the cursing? You see, that's what the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils is all about. One side is blessing. The other side is cursing. The one side is stay away from sin. The other side is be given over to your sin. Do whatever you want. You need to take this stuff seriously. Now let's look down through the verses here again. We'll go back through. I want to make a few points. Four points actually. Um, verse 15 there in Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 15 talks about the wine cup of this fury at my hand and it's connected to a sword in verses 16 and 27. Point number two, verse 28, get down to verse 28 there, it shows that God forces all to drink from the cup. Verse 29 says that God will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, like we read. Now, the third point I want to make is verse 30 says, prophesy thou against them all these words. Hmm. You can see it right there. And uh, it also says in that same passage, God will shout as they that tread the grapes. Huh. Verse 30. Down towards the end there. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Grapes. Cup. Wine. Blood. New Testament. Hmm. One other question before we move on to the next passage. Was God angry because they rejected His word? Yes, He was. God still gets angry because people reject His word. Right now, people think that God is weak because He's not doing anything. Oh, where's your God at? Where is He? Oh, uh, He's coming. But now let's go back up a little bit here in this passage. Um, Jeremiah chapter 25, we're going to jump actually up to verse 8 and read down to verse 14. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, because ye have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and an hissing and perpetual desolations. Let me bring it up to modern times here, 2022. If uh, Nebuchadnezzar there, or Nebuchadnezzar said other ways, you know, throughout the Bible, um, if he was the servant of the Lord, if God could control him, do you think that Vladimir Putin today of Russia and uh, Xi Jinping from China, do you think that they could be called the servants of the Lord? And God could actually turn them on the West here in America and destroy this country with those men? Yes, I think so. Very easily. Hmm. Verse 10. Moreover, I will take from the voice of take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it shall come to pass, when seventy years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon the land all my words, words, which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book. 
which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. You might say that uh, the cup of the devils that they decided to drink is going to be their punishment. The fury of the Lord comes. But ultimately, what does it go back to? The Bible. <laughs> Very simple. And uh, I've always wanted to chart this out, but uh, it just seems like every single time a new version comes out, some kind of sin happens as a result of that. Some kind of national problem, some kind of a national judgment. And the devil's servants, they just keep coming out with new versions and new versions and new versions. Oh, we have to have a newest one here. Well, this one was good in the past, but now it's no good anymore. And now we have to have this and we have to do that. And they're just bringing more and more evil. It's kind of like the thing of uh, quantitative easing or stimulus or whatever else here in America. The Federal Reserve, they just keep printing more money. You know, we're over $30 trillion dollars in admitted debt now, but uh, it's okay. I think the, you know, what got us into that problem? Well, we printed too much money. How do we get out of the problem? Let's print more money. <laughs> hey, we're in a lot of problems right here, a lot of trouble right now because of rejecting the word of the Lord. What should we do? Let's reject it some more. And that's what people are doing. Uh, I'm not going to be part of that. I don't want to be part of the judgment that comes and hits. And I believe that God can preserve uh, the righteous. I think that's why America is still around. Um, but I think that God can preserve the, the righteous even if His judgment hits this nation. But only if you're drinking the cup of the Lord and saying, I cannot drink the cup of devils and the cup of the Lord. I'm not interested. Jeremiah 49 Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 7 through 12. Concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Flee ye, turn back, dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will visit him. If grape gatherers, hmm, grape gatherers, like wine, in other words, come to thee, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have till they have enough. But I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Leave thy fatherless children. I will preserve them alive, and let thy widows trust in me. For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And art thou uh, he that shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. For I have sworn by myself, saith the Lord, that Bozrah shall come, become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all the cities thereof shall be per perpetual wastes. So, pretty amazing there. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because grape gatherers, if you look at uh, verse 9, grape gatherers come to thee, thieves by night. They're compared to thieves by night. Kind of an interesting thing there. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Go there. If you're probably familiar with this passage, but if you're newly saved, this will probably be an interesting thing for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. But of the times and the season, seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Huh. It's kind of an interesting thing there that the Lord is basically saying that there are grape gatherers and they can bring the cup of the Lord. And uh, it's a blessing to those who are saved. Uh, the day of the Lord when it comes as a thief in the night, um, I'm not worried about that. I'm actually looking forward to it. Uh, the Lord can come and, and take me out of here, out of this earth, anytime He wants to. Um, it'll be a real blessing when He finally does, when He says, okay, no announcements, no, um, you know, I better make sure I have permission to do this first before, you know, I come and catch my the body of Christ up to be in heaven with me. I, I better make sure I have the right clearances and, you know, have everybody has their passport, and a background check and everything, of course. Thief in the night. One 
day I'm here, next day I'm not. Where'd that crazy preacher go? Huh, he's not there. A thief got me because I'm drinking the cup of the Lord. The New Testament. Well, I'm a Jew. I reject the New Testament. I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. He's not my Messiah and whatever else. I refuse to drink that cup. Okay, then drink your cup of devils. Do you want to drink the cup of devils? You're going to be filled with your ways. You're going to get to have your own wickedness correct you. Go back to Jeremiah chapter 51. <coughs> Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah 51, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me, a destroying wind, and will send unto Babylon fanners that shall fan her and shall empty her land. For in the day of trouble they shall be against her round about. Against him that bendeth, let the archer bend his bow, and against him that lifteth himself up in his brigadine, um, and spare ye not her young men, destroy ye utterly all her host. Thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans, and they that are thrust through in her streets. For Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Flee out of the... So no replacement theology, in other words. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, and deliver every man his soul, be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her, unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. What? Babylon hath been a cup in, a golden cup in the Lord's hand? What was the first reference to a golden cup? The one that was in Pharaoh's hand? Hmm. That's an interesting thing. That made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore the nations are mad. <laughs> Look no further than modern day America to see a crazy nation. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. How for her? Take balm for her pain. If so be, she may be healed. We, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go every one into his own country, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. Huh. Interesting. Go next to Lamentations chapter 4. Can God use a wicked nation like Babylon? Yes, he can. Can God use Nebuchadnezzar? Yes, he can. Did God use Pharaoh? Yes, he did. Can God use China? Can God use Russia? India? Any of the other BRICS nations? Yes, he can. Hmm. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken, and thou shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. Huh. You mean to tell me the cup brings judgment? Yes, it does. Ezekiel 23. Go to Ezekiel chapter 23. Ezekiel chapter 23. I'll have to get one more page yet. All right. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, there were two women, the daughters of one mother, and they committed whoredoms in Egypt. They committed whoredoms in their youth. There were their breasts pressed and there they bruised the teats of their virginity. And the names of them were uh, Ahola the elder and Aholiba her sister. And they were mine, and they bare sons and daughters. Thus were their names Samaria 
is Ahola, and Jerusalem is Aholaba. And Ahola played the harlot when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed with blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all of them she, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols she defiled herself. Neither left her, neither left she her whoredoms, um, brought from Egypt. For in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised the, the breasts of her virginity, and poured their whoredom upon her. Wherefore I have delivered her into the hand of their, her lovers, into the hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. These discovered her nakedness, they took her sons and her daughters, and slew her with the sword, and she became famous among women, for they had executed judgment upon her. And when her sister Aholaba saw this, she was more corrupt in her inordinate, inordinate love than she, and in her whoredoms more than her sister in her whoredoms. She doted upon the Assyrians, her neighbors, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding upon horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw that she was defiled, that they took both one way, and, and that she increased her whoredoms. For when they saw, for when she saw men pouring, portrayed upon the wall, the images of the Chaldeans portrayed with vermilion, girded with girdles upon their loins, exceeding in dyed attire upon their heads, all of them princes to look to, after the manner of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. And as soon as she saw them with her eyes, she doted upon them, and sent messengers unto them into Chaldea. And the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love, and they defiled her with their whoredom, and she was polluted with them, and her mind was alienated from them. So she discovered her whoredoms, and discovered her nakedness, then my mind was alienated from her, like as my mind was alienated from her sister. Yet she multiplied her whoredoms in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, wherein she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. For she doted upon their paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. Thus thou callest to remembrance the lewdness of thy youth, and bruising the, thy teats by the Egyptians for the paps of thy youth." Therefore, O Aholaba, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side, the Babylonians and all the Chaldeans, Pekod and Shoa and Koah, and all the Assyrians with them, and all of them desirable young men, captains and rulers, great lords and renowned, all of them riding upon horses, and they shall come against thee, with chariots, wagons, and wheels, and with an assembly of people, which shall set against thee buckler and shield and helmet round about, and I will set judgment before them, and they shall judge thee according to their judgments. And I will set my jealousy against thee, and they shall deal furiously with thee. They shall take away thy nose and thine ears, and thy remnant shall, be, shall fall by the sword. They shall take thy sons and thy daughters, and thy residue shall be devoured by the fire." They shall also strip thee out of thy clothes, and take away thy fair jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee, and thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt any more. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will deliver thee into the hand of them whom thou hatest, into the hand of them from whom thy mind is alienated. And they shall deal with thee hatefully, and shall take away all thy labor, and shall leave thee naked and bare, and the nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered, both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. I will do these things unto thee, because thou hast gone a-whoring after the heathen, and, ha and because thou art polluted with their idols. You might say that they were drinking the cup of devils. Verse 31, Thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. Hmm. Thus saith the Lord God, Thou shalt drink of thy sister's cup, deep and large. Thou shalt be laughed to scorn and had in derision. It containeth much. Thou shalt be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with the cup of thy sister Samaria. Thou shalt even drink it and suck it out, and thou shalt break the sherds thereof and pluck off thine own breasts, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because thou hast forgotten me, and cast me behind thy back, 
Wherefore, therefore bear thou also thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. It's a pretty bad thing there. Um, so what's it talking about? Well, Samaria and Jerusalem have committed whoredom and spiritual fornication, in other words, with the heathen, and the heathen actually ended up hating them and killing them for it. It's a rather interesting thing. Um, there are a lot of women out there that really play the play like harlots or whatever else, and they mess around with guys and things, and when the guy finally gets his way with that woman, the guy ends up hating that woman. Hmm. Saw that in high school growing up. Go to the book of Habakkuk. Um, that's where we're going to go next. But I saw that many times. They were young girls, and, and uh, they were rather um, dressed rather inappropriately. A couple of devils, you know. Uh, they allowed the sin and everything in their life. They didn't try to fight it. And what happened? Well, you had a bunch of guys, or some guy would come along, and, and um, he'd be her boyfriend. You know, they'd be going out, and they'd go to school dances together and whatever else. And um, he would eventually get his way, and they'd commit fornication, and then they'd break up, and he's done with her. I saw that many times. A guy will be very nice to a woman until he gets his way, and then he's gone. Well, that's the way it is if you are if you are spiritually fornicating with the heathen when you're chosen of the Lord. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15 through 20. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. So it isn't just the, you know, the cup of the Lord, the cup of devils. It's you know God doesn't touch the cup of the devils. No. That wickedness, God says, oh, you want that? Here you go, drink it. Hmm. Verse 17. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image and the teacher of lies that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? Uh, woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing, because uh, the cup of the Lord's right hand, Jesus, in other words, shall be turned unto them, and it will lead to shameful spewing. Shameful spewing. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14 through 17. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Hmm. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Just like what uh, happened there with the Samaria and Jerusalem. They're decked with stones they have all this wealth and everything else and they're committing spiritual fornication and god says oh you want that do you well here you go thine own wickedness shall correct thee drink the cup of devils go ahead drink of it you want to get away from me and my word the cup of the new testament of the new testament in my blood you want to get away from that you don't want me you put me behind your back you forsake my words then go ahead and drink drink that cup See what it gets you. It leads to shameful spewing is what it leads to. Zechariah chapter 12. Back to the Old Testament again. Zechariah chapter 12. And uh, Zechariah chapter 12 verses 1 through 4. 
The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth, stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling hmm. unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. And that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every ho horse of the people with blindness. Um, the burden of the word of the Lord, the cup of trembling, the people will be cut in pieces by the sword of God. You say, where's that at? Go to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Huh. The burden of the word of the Lord. The Lord opens his mouth, and out of his mouth comes his word. And he kills them, he destroys them. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's tie in another verse here. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any, than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner, discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Jesus the Word of God is the sharp sword that judges us. The King Jesus version judges you. Hmm. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 23. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, on the left in thy kingdom. And But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. Okay, And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, it is, is, is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Um, Jesus had to pay for sins on the cross. He drank the cup of devils. His disciples would drink of the cup of the New Testament. So the Lord had to take the punishment for sin. He became sin who knew no sin. He had to drink the cup of devils. He drank it for us. Uh, all the wicked things that we have done, and the Lord tasted of that for every man. Pretty amazing when you think about it, the great price that he had to pay for that. And in exchange, we get to drink of the cup of the New Testament in his blood. Hmm. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 25 through 26. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup. Don't worry about what's in there. A cup of devils, but you know, hey, that looks nice on the outside. Make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. It's a cup of devils that they're drinking. Thou blind Pharisee, Cleanse first that which is within the cup, 
and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. <clears throat> you need to exchange that cup of devils for the cup of the Lord. Matthew chapter 26. We've gone through this passage a couple times now, but we're going to hit it again to show you some interesting things here. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to the, to, his, to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, a couple points to make there. First of all, like I made a little bit of an emphatic point, Jesus told all of them to drink from the cup, like we read back in the Old Testament. You're going to drink it one way or the other. The cup that's in the Lord's hand. Hey, this is a blessing to you. This is a blessing to you. Will you drink it? Will you accept it that way? Oh, you want to live in sin, do you? Okay, then here. There's the cup of the devils. Here's the sword of the Spirit. And it's going to cut you to pieces. They drank the blood of the New Testament. Another point I've written down here. Jesus prophesies Israel's rejection of the New Testament with the Millennial Kingdom. Until the Millennial Kingdom. You read about that there. Um, verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth, henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus knew what the Jews were going to do. Given them a chance, but they were going to reject him. He knew it. And so he's saying, uh, I'm not going to have that fellowship with you. Um, you're going to be getting the cup of devils in the future, the nation of Israel. Uh, I won't be drinking this cup of blessing, this cup of the Lord. I won't be drinking it. Uh, with you until I come back and the new covenant comes in. The new Testament came in with the blood, the death of the testator, but the new covenant doesn't come in until the end of the time of Jacob's trouble going into the thousand year kingdom. Don't let anybody tell, try to tell you that the new Testament and the new covenant are the same thing. They're not. A lot of these new versions from the Vatican change new Testament to new covenant. And it's not true. That's a lie. Matthew chapter 26 Verse 36 through 44. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup... Pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Uh, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Jesus prayed three times for the cup to pass away from him. What was that cup? It wasn't the cup of the Lord. It was the cup of devils. Jesus was going to have to drink that. Luke chapter 22, verse 17. Go there next. Luke chapter 22, Luke 22 and verse 17, <clears throat> and he took, took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Huh. Um, kind of an interesting thing because what do we have? We have the cup of the New Testament. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Huh. How about that one? The New Testament is supposed to be properly divided. But only the disciples of Jesus understand that one. 
If you're not dividing the New Testament, then uh, you're not one of Jesus' disciples. But now let's go to verse 18, down to verse 20. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Um, the New Testament came in when God's blood was shed, as we've been covering in these studies. No question about that. John chapter 18, verse 11. John chapter 18, verse 11. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, the sheath, the cup which my Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? You have no option, brethren. You're going to drink the cup. Everybody drinks the cup, one way or the other. You drink the cup of the Lord, or you drink the cup of devils. You want to be a sinner that's filled with your own ways? All the wickedness that's in that cup, all the lust of the flesh, and you look and you say, let me drink that. But if you're saved, you can't drink of that anymore. That's done. It's over. You can't mess with it. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. We'll see another reference to the cup here. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The cup of God's indignation will be poured out on all those who reject his commandments. And it will be. All right. Revelation chapter 16. Go there next. Revelation 16, verse 17. Revelation 16, verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her... The cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Hmm. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Hmm. Jerusalem, in other words, the great city, is divided into three parts, uh, which is interesting because Jesus asked three times to have the cup removed. Hmm. But it's interesting, too, because Babylon finally gets to drink of the cup of God's fierce wrath. Um, she has a cup. We'll see that here. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden, what, cup? In her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her, her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. 
And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. She finally gets to drink the cup of God's judgment. We read about back there in Jeremiah chapter 51. Babylon is a cup of judgment. And there's a lot of wickedness and evil and horrible things in there. And it's free to anybody that wants it. You want the cup of devils? You want to listen to the Vatican? Read her versions, her corrupted versions of the Bible and, and look at all the sins and everything that she's okay with and looks the other way and all that other stuff? Okay, go out and drink it. And that wickedness will come back and judge you one day. Revelation 18. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partaker of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. Look at this one. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Wow, <laughs> that's a bad thing. Uh, I don't think you want, I mean, it's bad enough getting the cup of the fierceness of God's wrath, but when it's doubled, that's a big problem. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Hmm. Revelation 19, verses 1 through 6. And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and all ye that fear him, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Can't wait for that day. What an amazing time that will be when we get to finally be there with the Lord in His presence. <sighs> That's going to be it for the study. Um, I have thought about this thing so many times over the years. How far do we take this thing of the Bible version issue? Um, you want to kind of give in and you kind of want to have grace and there's people that really sound legitimate, but they just, I don't understand why they turn against the King James Bible. And, and uh, is the King James Bible perfect? Is it just a translation? Is it, uh, and you, you have all these thoughts go through your mind, but yet there is no replacement for the King James Bible with these people. If they don't believe in the King James Bible, they don't replace it with anything. It's just other than their own opinions. They're not Bible-believing Christians. Um, and I believe that God's seal of approval is upon one book, and one book only. And that's the King James Bible. And the Lord allows enough issues, quote-unquote, with the King James Bible, that lost people can grab them and say, there, there's my excuse. I mean, the old saying goes, if, if you know, if you want to hang yourself, God will give you the rope to do it. You know, basically, if you're determined to hate the King James Bible and to find errors with it, well, okay. God will say, oh, there you go. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, the Bible talks about. Um, somebody wants to go against the book, against the Word of God, well, okay. Um, those of us that are saved, that are born again, um, 
I won't go against the Bible. Ever. Uh, if there's things in it that I can't understand, and that's my problem. Um, it's not the Bible that needs to be rewritten. Uh, far from it. Um, I'm the one who's an idiot. I'm the one who's foolish and stupid and whatever else, and I need help from the Lord. I'm not going to go against this book. Never. It's not happening. Um, this book, to conclude this whole study, this book is not Jesus. Okay? I understand that. I fully understand that. I've written all through this book, you know, I mean, all my notes and everything else. I can't write on Jesus. I wouldn't dare write on Jesus. But what I'm saying, brethren, is this book's about Jesus Christ. This book glorifies my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This book tells me about Him. It tells me about His feelings, about His sufferings, about His pain, His frustrations, what He has planned for the future. It's a great book. And if you reject this book, I'm sorry, you're not saved. I'm very sorry about that. I'm not going to change. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I feel bad for people that they're so wicked, that they're so evil, that they can't just, I just can't, ah, I can't get enough of that cup of devils. I just, oh, I love the taste of it. I love that adultery. Oh boy. Oh man. I love that fornication. I love the drugs. I love the cigarettes. I love the alcohol. I love the profanity. I love the, all the different things. Um, that's, that's a shame. That's a real shame. Um, as a Christian, uh, I don't want any of that stuff. Uh, I understand that my Bible says that I cannot, ye cannot, drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot. My flesh and my spirit are at war all the time. And um, there's no break. Okay? Um, there's only a discharge of duty, so to speak. When the Lord finally says, okay, come up hither. Or, um, time for you to die. Um, and that's why a lot of lost people, they get to a point where they realize, you know, this uh, Christianity stuff, I don't really like it because it's constantly fighting. There's no time off. Um, this isn't what I signed up for. I think I'm done now. And that's what they do, and that's why they quit. And that's why people finally get to a place where they say, you know what? It's not perfect. It's just a translation. I don't have to follow it anymore. Oh, good. Oh, boy. I'm so glad. And in so doing, they don't even realize they've just rejected Jesus Christ. Because you see, everything that you know about Jesus comes from a book. You reject the book, you're rejecting the Lord. Say, well, you're using the book to prove it. Yeah, that's called being a Bible-believing Christian. <laughs> so, that is going to be it for this series of studies. I'd really love to hear people's thoughts and comments and whatever else. Uh, if you know of any other scriptures or whatever, um, please put them down in the comments below. Um, if people will start to come in here, if you're an Alexandrian atheist, that you worship an idiot God that once wrote a book and he lost it, now he just kind of gives us a bunch of poor copies and we all, you have to just determine what God's word is for you and your preferences. And, and if you come here to destroy people's faith and try to put questions and doubts in people's minds about this King James Bible, you're done. I, don't, I really don't care about you. I really don't. You know, it's, it's sad to me that you're so foolish that you would go around and mess around with a couple of devils, that you re would reject Jesus Christ in the record of him, his book, um, and yet proclaim that you love him. That's sad to me that you're that wicked. But uh, I have no tolerance for you. I have none. And when I see the wrath of God come upon you, hmm, look at that. And uh, that goes for family as well. I have a lot of family that rejects this blessed book. And they try to tear it down in people's eyes and whatever else. They know not to come after me. They know not to try to talk, you know, me out of it. Because quite frankly, and I don't say this in pride, I say this just as a matter of fact, I'd tear their hide off. Because you're going after my book. This is the book that I live my life by. 
don't go after it because I'll go after you. So that's going to be it. Um, I do have a bunch of uh, things I'm going to be working on here. I've recorded all these studies so that I can put them out and everything and, and uh, have some time that I can really get caught up on some other studies and on some other work that I'm going to be doing. And I'm planning to really come out and go after the new versions again and uh, like I used to. I haven't done that in a while and I really want to start slamming these new versions and really start to um, make some big things happen, some big attacks happen on the new Bible versions that come from the Vatican. Um, there's a lot of wicked things that they are part of and that they're doing and saying and whatever and a lot of people don't realize how bad it really is. Um, so, um, I guess that'll be it for the study. I do hope it's been an encouragement to you to stand by the Word of God. Uh, don't let anybody ever take away your King Jesus version. So, please do keep us in your prayers. Thank you very much for watching.